Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is May 15th, 2018, uh, and we are super excited for today's episode. Uh, today, uh, we are uh, re-interviewing Sean McCraney. Um, for those of you who don't remember, um, we're doing this series on bringing back some of our original interviewees, some of our most interesting and informative uh, and entertaining interviewees, kind of to see where they are um, so many years later. So we've brought Greg Prince on recently. We've brought Carolyn Pearson on recently. We brought Dr. Michael Coe on recently. Uh, we're bringing people back. And we are now bringing back Sean McCraney. Um, <clears throat> some of you are, will remember Sean from episodes 126 through 128 of Mormon Stories. Uh, at the time, uh, Sean had a TV show that was very, very popular called Heart of the Matter, uh, and he had published a book called Born Again Mormon. So Sean uh, was raised LDS, and then uh, he uh, left the LDS church and eventually had a, a born again sort of conversion to Christianity, and then became a preacher, or a pastor, or a minister, and he's been doing that uh, ever since. So we brought him on uh, Mormon Stories. It's a really good episode. It talks about he struggled with all sorts of things before and after his uh, faith crisis and leaving the church. He has been known to be kind of really tough on the Mormon church and on Joseph Smith and to dig really deeply into the challenges and the problems with Mormon history and culture and theology and with their version of Christianity. Uh, and, and so uh, it was so fun to have Sean on years ago. Uh, we even got him to sort of be uh, thoughtful and a little bit kind and respectful to Joseph Smith, I thought. Yeah. A lot of people were surprised uh, to hear you willing to say some nice things here and there. Mm. So people were really touched by that interview and we're really thrilled to have you back. Now, for those of you who've been paying attention, Sean interviewed me on his program a couple weeks ago. Uh, so you've already listened to that episode. But now we're turning the tables once again uh, back on Sean. Now, Sean uh, has a website. Sean, tell us the name of that website. HOTM.TV. That's heart of the matter, HOTM.TV. TV. Um, and <clears throat> he runs a church now called Campus Church. Tell us what, Campus Ministries. Tell us what yeah. Campus stands for. It's an uh, acronym, right? It's an acronym. It used to stand for Christian Assemblies Meeting to Prayerfully Understand Scripture. Then we changed it to any A word. Uh, Christian artists, Christian anarchists, Christian asses, whatever it is, meeting to prayerfully understand scripture. We All realized right. assembly was, was just too uh, vague. We wanted to be more specific. Any A word. And where's your church uh, located? We're, we're here we're, in it now? We're here in the church. This is in Murray, and uh, it's on the website, campuschurch.tv. We have a small crowd, mostly former LDS, and who are still searching to understand Jesus and the Bible, really the Bible. We teach the Bible and we get out of here. Nothing midweek, uh, nothing uh, ancillary. It's just we teach and leave. And it's not just a physical presence. You also live stream, right? We live stream and we have pretty good audience that, that tunes in every week for milk or meat. Um, it's also important to mention that we've also been doing a series on Mormon stories about options for spirituality and faith after leaving Mormonism. So. Uh, you know, over half of those who leave the LDS Church for some reason become atheists or agnostic. Plenty of our episodes are supportive of that audience. But recently, we've done interviews with uh, followers of Denver Snuffer, who you last uh, interview called him one of the three yeah. prophets. Religious leaders. Religious leaders in, in Utah. Utah. Um, you're, you're another one. Uh, okay. I'm, <laughs> apparently, I'm another one. And then uh, we also went to uh, South Mountain um Christian Church, yeah. uh, SMCC. Southmont Community, yeah. And we, we did a, a <coughs> nice interview with them. And, you know, afterwards I got a call from you expressing some concern. Yeah. And so not only are we going to talk about what Sean's doing, his history since our last interview, um, and kind of how things have evolved for him and his ministry, we're also going to talk about your concern with other Christian churches around here yeah. and why you feel strongly about what you're doing. Mm. And we want to do that in a way where we can be honest and open and, and thoughtful, but maybe also as respectful as we can be, because, you know, I, I feel like anyone who's trying to do good deserves um, 
deserves respect and credit, but that doesn't mean we can't be thoughtfully critical. So we'll do that as well. Good guidance. You gave me that same guidance when you first interviewed me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be respectful, Sean. We can talk about anything. I'm glad. <laughs> All right. All right. So, um, so without any further ado, we're not going to do announcements for this episode. Let's just dive right in. So it's been <clears throat> eight years since we interviewed last. Uh, tell us, for those who haven't listened, give us the sort of three-minute version of your story. We can refer people to those earlier episodes. Mm -hmm. Give us kind of the three-minute version of your story up until you started Heart of the Matter. Um, and then talk about, just in a minute or two, how successful Heart of the Matter got. And mm -hmm. then we'll talk about kind of what happened after our interview. Okay. Yeah, uh, LDS, love the church, love the activities just like you. Raised in Southern California, I went on the mission, married in the temple, uh, but I was unlike you. I was not a Nephi, I was a core whore. I was uh, always in, in my flesh, always uh, uh, lean towards sin. So I was active in the Mormon church, but I could never get my act together morally. I, it, it was, I was just really, really out there. Uh, but I got As my- As a missionary? Uh, no, 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 before the mission. Okay. Got on the mission, reformed myself, but when I got home that day, I realized I just kept myself busy. It really wasn't an inner reform. And so I longed for something that's authentic. I, I mean, I, I really could play uh, duplicitous roles, but it bugged my soul. So I didn't have that authentic heart for God yet. My, my life was in opposition to it. Uh, long story short, stayed active, all the uh, different types of local leadership roles. And then I... What was the highest level of leadership you rose to in uh, the church? Stake High Counselor Bishop Rick, one, either oh, one. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Elder Scorn President. So you, yeah. were, you were in it. Seminary teacher, just yeah, like yeah. you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was in it. How many years after your mission did you remain in the church? Oh, uh, geez. After the mission, 22, I think. Yeah. 22 years? Yeah, after. Until you were how old? Till you 40. Were, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 40. All right. Had a roadside experience, changed my life completely. We talked about that on the first uh, shows with you. Give us the 30 second version. Uh, heard a radio preacher ask if you could get your life right before God, why haven't you done it? I had tried to do it. Were you religion. sinning as a Mormon? Yeah, as, as a Mormon, a, I was As an sinning. adult Mormon. As an adult Mormon, I was you sinning. Were, you were on the Bishop Rick and High Council, but you sinning, were- Sinning, yes. Like, like Mormon sins, meaning what? All sins. I mean, you know, there's like, Thinking Sexual about Sexual immorality. No, I was actively sinning by this point. Okay, like yeah. word of wisdom stuff. Word of wisdom. Law of chastity stuff. Law of chastity. Okay. Yeah, sinning. Okay. But I got to that point. And you were lying to your leaders? Yeah, I lied all the way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I lied because I, I, that, I started lying and sinning when I realized that this was not true. That's what happened with me. I stayed in. I knew it wasn't telling me the truth but I just stayed in for my family and for the roles. And the things that led you to believe it wasn't true, just the quick list. History, oh, just all the things with Sandra Tanner's websites. And uh, I read, of course, uh, uh, No nope. Man Knows My History. And it was those things that led me to believe it's not true. When I realized it wasn't true, stayed Mormon, fell apart morally, still had leadership callings, which is what made me laugh. I'm sorry, but I laughed about that. Uh, anyway, um, was excommunicated, asked to be, but I had a born again experience prior to that. To LDS people, that doesn't make sense for them. They think that you gotta be right morally to have God work in your life. I have found that he works more in my life when I'm really kind of messed up. And so he worked in my life strongly then. And it was, I heard a radio uh, preacher ask the question, if you get yourself right before God, why haven't you done it? And I thought I had tried. I really had tried with the Reformation for the mission and married in the temple and everything else. But in my heart, I was really just a rat, John. So I could not do anything about that. I tried. I really did, but it didn't work for me. So I listened to him and he says, the reason you haven't is because you can't. You can't reform yourself. Uh, there's someone who did that, does that for you, Jesus. He came and he lived a life that you can't live. And you look to him in faith and that is where you place your, your faith, not on your righteousness, not on your ability. And when I heard that. The preacher said that or God said that? Preacher said that. Preacher taught Who was that. the preacher? Charles Stanley, okay. big radio Christian preacher. Uh, and so I heard that message. By the end of that day, I had a spiritual experience that radically changed my life. I realized I am in my person a sinner. Um, 
Jesus came and lived a life I couldn't live, placed my faith and trust in him, and I was born again, as they talk about. And so I wrote, after that, wrote the book, Born Again Mormon. And my whole thing was, stay Mormon. Do you know Jesus? Have you been born again? I mean, I, the Book of Mormon talks about the mighty change and everything, but, but I didn't really, it never came through to me that that was taught, really. I don't remember ever being, Sean, have you been born again as a Mormon? And so uh, that began the ministry. And uh, after that, somebody here in Utah read the book. They asked if I would come and be a, a, a guest on a TV show on a station here. The show was... What year was this about? 2005. Okay. That's Very, the year I started Mormon Stories. Yeah, we were, so we were concurrent, the really. Time, yeah. yeah, and that aired on an afternoon, which was getting, it was a live call-in show, and they were getting one call or two calls, and they had over 30 calls from me being on there. And they had requests of like 100 books. We said, we'll give our book for free. There was like 100. So later, the manager of the station called me and said, you want to do your own show? I was living in Southern California. I was going to theology school at that time. I had no money, no experience. And so I said, sure, we'll do it. So I started flying up here on our credit cards to, to do our own show. We did our first show in March uh, 2006. And it was me just standing there and a live hour long show talking about the difference between Mormonism and Christianity. And that's how that started. Wow, I didn't realize it was right around the same time I was yeah. getting going. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so as your show picked up, you kind of had a brand as kind of like, I don't know, Bible thumping anti-Mormon. Now, that's yeah. not what you, how you would have characterized yeah. yourself, but maybe other people might have characterized yeah. you in that sure. way. Was that intentional? Yeah, uh, I didn't want it to be uh, anti-Mormon. Honest to God, I didn't want it to be anti-individual. I don't, did not care if an individual, I wanted it to be anti-Mormonism, corporate church, 12 apostles, screw them. I really did. So uh, to the authority, I was like, you have no respect for me at all. But to the individuals I maintain then and I maintain now, it's okay. I love you. I'm not going against you. You want to believe in Mormonism? I'm not your enemy. But that was never seen that way. So that was kind of lost in translation, so to speak. Uh, it was greatly misinterpreted. But our audience, John, on that live call-in show for those uh, seven years was not to the stalwart LDS, not to the Nephi guys. It was to the guys at the bar who were raised Mormon, who were not Mormon in any sense of the word, but still defended it and believed it was true. It was to them to relate to me and to look at me and get mad at me or whatever, and then kind of listen to the message of Jesus is our solution to this. That was, that's been the message that we started with, and that's still the message now. I'm curious about your strategy at the time you know, one strategy would be just preach Jesus. Like, yeah. don't ever talk about Mormonism. Why, what, what was it about your strategy that made you want to incorporate dissecting Book of Mormonism. Abraham, Joseph Smith, all the details, yeah. and even kind of, you know, um, criticizing the leadership and Big stuff. Time. How was that part of your strategy, why? Because I realized that up until this time, many people have preached Jesus and it never reached into the Mormon uh, group. They, they're like, oh, we believe that. You know, my mom listens to uh, Jesus preacher. She's full blown Mormon still. We are fine with that. We believe that's good. We just add to it. And it was the addition, which was the lack of Jesus in, what I felt was a lack of Jesus in those years in my life. And it was the additional stuff that was focused on. The tithing, the, the Sabbath day, the temple, the, that was not Jesus to me. That was, and so I got that part. I didn't get the Jesus part. Now maybe they taught it. I just didn't hear it. And because I didn't hear it, I knew there were others who didn't. So in, in order to say your presentation of Jesus is ineffective, I had to bring in Mormonism to compare the two. And that's why I went after both. And it was very, very effective. So talk about kind of how you measured success over those seven-ish years and how it grew. No analytics. I, I still don't understand any of that. But um, I knew what our effectiveness was by emails. And we were getting hundreds and hundreds of emails a week. And that was for a period of about seven years. So, uh, and then also it was... Um, Sometimes I would be invited to go to a place. It wasn't that often, but it was the crowds that would show up. Or we would open up and have an open house and the lines that would come for that. 
And I just knew from that there was an effect. If we took the, the sum of the emails and looked, I've either not joined the Mormon church, I've left the Mormon church, or I've come to know Jesus because of your show, it would be in the tens of thousands. And I knew we were having an effect. But there, the station didn't pay for any kind of Nelson, Nielsen ratings, so we didn't really know, you know. How did you survive financially throughout this time? We, uh, we did not ask for support for the first three years, which was a mistake. I went into deeper debt. Um, I personally have a real rub against money and religious ministry. I have no problem with money for, for a corporation or, or anything else, but religious ministry tied to God's name, I have a real rub with money. And I know that uh, because maybe it was because I went to the temple and, and Satan was in the employ, and I knew that Mormons were looking for that. So we did not ever, when we got into debt where it almost shut the ministry down, uh, some people came along and said, you got to start saying you can, we can use your support. When we did that in 2009, the tables turned radically. And we were bringing in close to a half mil and just saying, not saying, give us just a dollar or every, we'd say this, if you're led of God, if you're in a position and if you're not on a limited fixed income, we welcome you to support us financially. If you can't pray for us, that's all we did. And the money came in. Now, remember that station was full service, all of Utah, part of Idaho, part of Wyoming, part of Nevada. And then we were also on Dish TV to other states out there. So we were really reaching a pretty sizable audience and getting the emails to prove it. So you were up to half a million dollars a year in annual revenue? Yeah, donations. Where would that money go? Oh, it went to me. Right. It went to uh, the serving the websites. It went to producing books that we would give away uh, we it would do anything like that. I, I don't know. I, it, what was your max annual salary if you ninety grand? Sharing? Okay, so you didn't take three hundred thousand. No, no, we used all the money. It went to uh, helping benevolence, uh, not that much. It just went to my plane fares because I was still living in California. So and it also went to uh, any of the outside uh, festivities that we'd have where we would do open water baptisms, festivals. We never charged for anything, including books so it was like we would use donations to help uh subsidize anything like that but uh, 90 was the height and that was in 2000 uh about 2000 uh, the height of your personal salary personal salary yeah. um were you able to pay off your debts uh i was for it yeah i okay. think i finally got there okay yeah. um and uh were you, were you transparent in your finances? Was it a 501c3? We're did a 501c3. You, did you post, this is Aletheia Ministries. Aletheia, uh, Aletheia Media. Okay. Yeah. And were you, did you publish your, you know, no. finances on the web or anything like no. that? No. Okay. No. But if anyone ever asked, and again, I never t did the books and I didn't have the money. It was our partner who still runs our books. And he was one of our largest contributors. So he also not only contributed, but he ran the books and he made sure with our CPA that my salary was commensurate with the income coming in and all of that. We didn't break any rules. Uh, it really helped those few years where we had some money come in to alleviate that debt, but I've never been in it for the money. Okay. I'll take the money, but I've never been in it for it. Are, are, is the archive of all those Heart of the Matter episodes on YouTube or anywhere on the internet? They are. They're all over the internet. They're still there. They're all there. All there. Okay. Yeah. And we stand. Uh, we just start have converted. Well, actually, Wendy's converted a lot of them to uh, uh, podcasts, but um, we are convert reconverting all of them to a systematized podcast. And there are you know 380 hour long shows, and people still write us every week about Mormonism because they watch them on YouTube and we still have that outreach to people about Mormonism. What, do you know your YouTube channel? Is it H-O-T-M? Seth? Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, okay, so that's a lot of success. And yeah. uh, um, so by the time the Mormon Stories interview happened, uh, that was, was that kind of the pinnacle or, you know, of your success? Uh, no, 2008 wasn't. 2012 would have been the pinnacle. Okay, of so you success. kept going. Kept going. Four more yeah. years of bigger. success. Yeah. Got bigger. Yeah. So Mormons did Mormon Story. I was still in debt when I was on Mormon Story. We we didn't have an income. We weren't asking people for money when I did Mormon Story. Okay, okay. Yeah. That came after. It came good, after. Good, 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 good. Well, yeah. all right. So um, 
What happened? So you come on Mormon Stories, come you have four Stories. more years of success, then yeah. what happens? What happened, John, was it's a, a multifaceted uh, thing. First of all, uh, I started to burn out. I was doing it every week, flying back and forth, doing an hour show, doing uh, church services, and uh, I felt like I had run the gamut of church history. And our calls started coming in that were repetitive. Well, don't you think Joseph Smith could, I, it's just like, I, I was starting to visibly, it was starting to show. That was just like, ah, oh, come on. So I started to get tired. The second thing is Romney was running for president during that time and he was running against Obama. And so I'm representing evangelical Christianity, which at that point I, I kind of embraced about as much, uh, with about as much insight and reflection as I embraced Mormonism. I came to know the Lord from an experience. I believe that was uh, equal to my evangelical brothers. So I thought that's what I was and that's what we were. Well, uh, here comes Romney running for president and I'm saying, my brothers have said Mormonism's of the devil. They say it's a cult. They say it's evil and everybody who follows Mormonism is going to hell. And yet we have Romney show up to run for president and they're all saying Romney, Romney, because they didn't want Obama. And they said, well, it's the lesser of two evils, but, and, 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 and the hypocrisy pissed me off to no end. We were saying on the show all through 2012, look it, I'm sure Rom, uh, President-elect Romney would probably administratively be a really great president. Mormons are really good administratively. But the Mormon church wins if there's a Mormon president. And I was not for the Mormon church. So I, we said, don't do it. Well, remember, we have this whole state we're reaching, another state, and then we are on dish, and we're pushing this message out every week. And we're getting the emails that reflect, well, wait a minute, you know, we need to save our country. This is God's country. And like, you guys are so pathetic. You know, we have someone, you've been railing on Mormonism, the rubber meets the road, and now you want one to save you. It was just really angered me. The third thing is in this state, there is a reverend, his name is Greg Johnson. He, he, I hope I can mention names. He r represents a ministry called Standing Together. Is that it, a physical church? It's a physical ministry for churches. It's a para-ministry to churches. He's kind of uh, deemed himself the leader of these churches. He's uber. He's the one who brought Ravi Zacharias to the... Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, that's Greg Johnson. Is he friendly to the LDS Church? He's friendly. He and Bob Millett have a sit-down okay. show. That's, that's great. the ecumenical thing. That's the ecumenical thing. And then um, what are some of the biggest named physical churches that he would sort of represent or affiliate with? Uh, or that would affiliate with him? Well, I don't know the ones that affiliate with him, okay. but I know they're bigger. Like First Baptist, is it Presbyterian? Yeah. Or I, Usually the bigger ones. Okay. Yeah. All right. He's going back and forth to Washington because Romney's asked him to participate. Greg is uber politically driven. He's so political in his mind, in the Republican, that he's named his children, and I know some of these names are correct, America, Reagan, Jefferson, and whatever. So he's uber. So I'm on the TV, on the only Christian radio station, talking about Mormonism and saying don't vote, and he's out there going back and forth to Washington, and he represents the churches in the state. So there's the setup. I'm burning out. December of 2012, we announce, I am not going to do the show for a month. I'm not going to do church for a month. I'm going to go and visit the churches that people say they are going to because of our recommendation to leave Mormonism. And I'm going to see what they're doing. Because up until that time, you had never started a church. No. I never understood that. Yeah. I'm like, you've got this great following, this great ministry. Start a freaking church. Well, we started Bible studies. We just started getting together on Sundays and studying the Bible. But I didn't want to do a church thing. Mega church, man. Sean McCraney, <laughs> mega church. I'll be honest with you. I could have done that any time. Yeah. Yeah. You but got the personality for it? Got it. Got the personality. You had the TV reach? Got the TV Mega reach. Mega church, Sean McCraney. <laughs> I can't sell my soul. Dude. I did it when I was Mormon. I have to be authentic to myself. How would that have, at the time, how would that have been selling your soul? Because um, I was seeing, I went to Calvary Chapel, trained there, and I was just seeing that there was something about religion that is not the same thing as a relationship that I experienced at the side of the road. People don't need the religion. They need the relationship. You can find your religion at the boys club, taking judo. 
You can find your religion in any secular group you want. We don't need our churches to provide religion. We need our churches to teach people about the relationship that a human being can have with God through the Son. We don't need the churches to do anything else. And I was seeing from my days of becoming an evangelical that churches were more, uh, more than just that. They were a, a lot about other things. And I just didn't want to start something that was another thing. And that's honest. And so that's why we didn't. Okay. So I, we go and visit the other churches. We go to the top largest churches. South Mountain was one of them. We went to Calvary Chapel. We went to Washington Heights. We went to all the biggest churches in the state. K2? Went to K2, yeah. Yeah, went to K2. Uh, and so what did we see? I took a pad, paper, my wife with me with most of them, and I was stunned, stunned by what I saw. And, and, and I can't emphasize that enough. These frickers, I'm sorry. <laughs> These That's frickers. a Mormon swear word. All right, can I say what I want to say? <laughs> frickers, good. Okay. <laughs> These guys are taking people who have come out of the best organized religion on earth, Mormonism. You're not going to beat Mormonism when it comes to organization. And they're trying to be organized so that they can be, you know, uh, 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 in there in people's lives. And they start off their meetings with uh, the worship and the worship and the rock bands. One of them had a fog machine where the guitarist stands like this, like Jesus in front of the crowd. And, and, and the people are like, oh, oh, you know, and I can see what's going on. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. And, 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 and one of the guys in the band tells me, yeah, we, we say to each other, well, should we b base it up a little? Should we turn it to 11 to really get them to respond? And then what they do is they tie in the giving to that. All right, and now that everybody's kind of loosened up with the music, we're going to take a collection. And they call it tithes. Well, listen, I've been studying the Bible, man, and I'm in it. And that is a misappropriated word in the Christian world. It's not used in the, New, in the New Testament at all in the sense of we should do it. But Christian pastors say, let's go to the Old Testament and let's borrow that one because it really does benefit us if we can at least get 10%. That's the Malachi thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we remember that from the mission. So I'm watching the tithes get worked. Then I'm watching the tithes get worked again. And then I'm watching more music. Then finally they do, and then they do the announcements. And then it's, you know, more trying to be like, we want to be the relevant church for you to give your life to and you to take, bring your family to. Okay. And then finally the pastor gets up nine out of the 10 pastors gave a, a anecdotal recitation. Five out of those nine told stories about, yeah, I went up skiing with my son today. And it was just this, and I thought, you know, Lord, you've given such great creation. And my son did, Dad, you know, why is the snowflakes different? And so we're just talking about the snow. And, and it was just so, so cool, you know. And the Christian world, if you don't buy it, I love you. If you buy it, then this is it. You have to know the Word of God. You got to study the Bible if you're going to. Because the Christian Bible teaches that that Word goes in and it washes out the secular mindset of a human being. The people are coming out of Mormonism. They don't know the difference between Alma and Jonah pretty much. And they're going to church and they're not getting fed anything they need to really break from the bondage of religion. They're stepping from uh, the frying pan into the fire, in my estimation, at the hands of men and women who should be feeding them the word of God. They should be feeding them something that they can take and go out and be better people with because of it. And uh, it, I was inflamed. I was so ticked. So, January 1. I'll just say, we'll come back to Sean's concerns about other organized Christian religions yes. after his story. I don't want to derail the story by going into that. So stay tuned for a discussion <laughs> of Sean's concerns with other Christian groups in Utah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so 10 I'm, churches. January 1. I go live again, 2013. And I am filled with the righteous indignation of God. I mean, <laughs> I was wrong. In retrospect, I was wrong in the way I did it, but I could not help doing it this way. 
And I said, look, I'm not going to spend one ounce this year on Mormonism. I'm going to give every bit of my passion and time, everything I've got to exposing the religious heresy, the religious game playing of the churches in this state and what they are doing to people coming out of Mormonism, especially what they are having them believe. Uh, I was on the air, full power station in Utah, ripping on Mormons like mad for seven years. They couldn't get me off. Five days, five days, Greg Johnson went out. He got the churches and he got those pastors to step in and call the station and say, you got to get this guy off. How do you know? I know this because I got somebody forward me an email that Greg Johnson wrote and it said, I am proud to say that Sean McCraney will never be on the airway on the t on television again in the state of Utah. So he's taking credit for that. Yeah. Now, why would the owners of the television show? I'm sure they appreciated the success. Yeah. And I think they were even Christian, right? They are. They were. Yeah. So why would they allow this to happen if you had such a successful show? Well, and did you talk to them about it? Uh, no. I had had run-ins with the station management over the course of my time there for different things. Um, I, mock, I mocked Benny Hinn and the charismatic healings on stage. Well, the owners are charismatic Benny Hinn followers. And so I got sat down on that one. And I did some other things in there that troubled them. They were taking our tapes and they were, re they were taping over them. So we had no backup. So I went and I took all of our tapes. Well, they were rightly owned by the station. So that ticked them off. And I was outspoken. I mean, and if you get the pastors who are representing Christianity, talking to the Christian station, and they just felt probably, we're gonna sell this station down the road. This guy's run his course. We don't care if he's at the height of his, of his popularity or not. We're getting rid of him. And they did. Okay. Yeah. So um, you, why didn't you have some big argument where you went down and yelled Tried. at them? Or, okay. I, called, I called the owners, called the manager, called the people I knew, and they just said, no, decisions made, decisions made, decisions made. So it was done. They could, see, the problem was, John, they could never really um, rope me in from the day one. And I, we were so popular almost from day one that they really couldn't edit me. They couldn't do much but they wanted to a lot on different subjects. And they were constantly saying, why don't you try to do it this way? And why don't you try to do it that way? There was a lot of um, behind the scenes stuff. And I just think they were fed up with me. And I, could, I can see why. You know. Did you ever have a conversation with Greg Johnson about that? Did you call him up and I've say, I've called what, Greg, what he does heck? not return my calls. Okay, no. so you've never met him face to face? Oh no, I know him. Oh. Yeah. It was his show that I was on when I was first invited to come out. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was he his invited show. you. He actually, the station managers invited me and told Greg, hey, on your show, we want this guy to come on and do it. So that's how Greg and I first met. Yeah, and I was, we were always friendly. In fact, as a human being, he's very personable. He's likable, but he led the charge and uh, I think he considers it a victory. I considered it a loss. I, can, I took it really hard. And I felt like all the stuff we had done and accomplished I thought we were going to lose it, but in retrospect, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. Um, so talk to us about that fall. What was that like to go from seven years of a successful program yeah. to not being on the air? What that did to your donations, what it did to your ministry and to your self-esteem and yeah. mental health? Yeah, it gutted the ministry quickly financially um because people were just like you're not doing it anymore we sent out newsletters to all of ten thousand people and said listen all of our content is still on there and we're going to continue to produce content to in the subjects don't give up on us but it didn't matter that the show was gone and so that that happened quickly that started going down quickly um personally i went through my own dark night and um i felt like uh I was done for with what I really believed I was. I honestly believed and still believe in my heart that I was called by God to come to Utah to help liberate exiting Mormons from religion. And I felt like he had kind of like said, no, you got too much, you were too proud, you were too this, no, you're done. And I thought it was probably over. 
that lasted for about a week. I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty much of a fighter. And so after a week, I said, no, nah, we're going to fight back. And so I started coming back and uh, decided we're going to do our own studio. We're going to build our own streaming studio. And it um, took a while, but we did it. How long did it take? I was kicked off in 13. Um, I would say, I'm trying to think. I think within five months, we bought a TriCaster. Cost us about 20 grand. And uh, we started TriCasting out of a house. Looked horrible. And then we got this place and we started just building this place out more and more. And we started streaming and Seth and, 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 and Kathy Maggie, the people behind us, they got it all working. And we just have just learned and grown. And uh, we've kept, we've built actually an entirely new, not entirely new, but about a 90% new following. And it's for people who are really looking for religious freedom. It's not so much the, the Mormon thing anymore. I don't talk about it very much at all, much to the chagrin of most people. They want that from me and it's not there anymore because I've come to see the faith in a different way, including Mormonism. And when that came amidst a bunch of other things that led to it, all that former audience and the former support waned, they left. Another reason our popularity went is because in the state, all of our fans watched that one show and they thought I'd lost my mind. Their pastors reiterated, this guy is not, don't listen to him anymore. And I pretty quickly lost my reputation. I became a, a anathema to some people. Yeah. So. Okay. So you rebuild the ability to stream. Yeah. When did the decision to actually create a, a campus or a church kind of come into the picture. We had been meeting in that Bible study up at the U of U for all those years. And we just said, well, why should we have our studio here and go up there? Let's just bring it all in house. So we started to formally do a church called campus with milk and meat. And we started it up there and then we came down here and transferred it and it all became one ministry church and then the shows. And about when did that happen here? 2014. Okay. I think. So four years ago? Yeah, yeah. You started campus? Yeah. Here? Full time, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How did you keep these volunteers energized and eager to support you? I don't. Were your volunteers paid? No, they're not. So why would they want to spend their time and energy helping you? I, I think they are seekers. I think they realize that most of them have been raised in religion of some sort. I think they realize and have seen that there is freedom here. There is total freedom here. And, um, there are, and that means doctrinal, theological, expressional, lifestyle, total freedom here. And we do focus on teaching the word and searching. And I think they just want something that is at least trying to be true. I, I, I think that about them. They're in it because somehow it helps them in their life, I think. And Maybe gives them a sense of service, a sense sure, of mission, sure. sense of purpose. It does me. That's yeah. why I'm here, you know. So, so do you think? Do you think of yourself as a pastor then? Pastored. What it's does a that combination mean? of a pastor and a bastard. I'm a pastored. <laughs> <laughs> I, I. This is part of the of the thing, John, and this is why I didn't do the mega church. And I, I really believe we talked about humility when you and I you and I talked. I think. It's really important for those who follow Jesus to serve and not to, like John the Baptist said, increase. They need to decrease. So I have to consciously decrease my natural um, skills, my natural char charisma, and my ability to lead if I want. Uh, I have to tone that down constantly so that people don't think anything of me. I don't want to be thought of as anything because I'm not, I'm really a rat bastard, really. It's only Jesus who has in my life taken me and moved me to something that is worthwhile. So he gets the credit. And so I try to really eliminate any man centeredness in what we do. And that's a goal. Yeah, I really believe in that. But it probably limits your growth, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And the financial support. Absolutely, they, people want they want certainty. They want an, a noble leader. They want to be told this is the truth 
and they want that cult of personality. I won't give it to them, and I disappoint them with it often. We did a show about six weeks ago, first time in the show. I dropped the F-bomb throughout the show. It was about me being fat and emails coming in saying you're overweight. And I dropped the F-bomb on purpose so that people can say, this guy is not someone who's like Jesus. We don't look at him as a religious leader. We look at him as a teacher and a thinker. And if we like what he does, we'll accept it. And if we don't, it's okay. We can we cannot. They have to have that freedom, I think. So you, you wrote in an outline uh, that I've been kind of reading through that you went through your own you know, in-depth study of Christianity, maybe like you had never studied it before, which yeah. I found yeah. to be interesting. Yeah. And then you did an inventory of your beliefs of Christianity and of Christianity yeah. and started to maybe scrutinize some of the yeah. commonly held tenets. Big time. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. <clears throat> big, All right. huge. All right. Okay. So I want your audience to know that I have had the luxury I, I, like I made, you know, twenty five thousand dollars in doing this last year. I want the luxury to be of being able to fully go after this subject with all my heart. So since two thousand six, I have been in the Bible at least four hours a day. I get up at between four and five, and I am at Einstein's, and I'm in the Bible studying. The Which topics. Einstein's? It's up on South Temple and E Street. Okay. Yeah, I'm there. For every those who morning. want to come visit, yeah, you, and they do. Check Sean out. Yeah, I do. We have little conferences. Einstein's and Third. Yeah. No, uh, South Temple South and E Street. South Temple and E E Street. Street. Yeah, they can check my. That's yeah. newer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I'm there every morning in the world, and I've done that since 2006. So it's 2018 now. When I was kicked off the air. 16. Six or 16? 2006. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so when I was kicked off the air and I saw how the evangelicals were treating Romney and Obama and I saw how evangelicals were treating me as a person because I spoke out and said I was going to examine them, I said, I've got to know what's going on. It started when someone gave me a book. They gave me a book. I've, over the years, I get about 30 books a year. I never read them. Someone gave me a book, and it was God's Sacred Secret. It was written by a former pastor. I said, I don't know why, but I'm going to read this book. The whole thing was a stripped down, looking at the Greek, looking at the context of hell in the New Testament. And God, in the end, God's sacred secret is, it's done. Not that it wasn't. It's done. It's over. Kaput. That's the good news proven by the New Testament. That's the thing about proven by the New Testament. The people who don't want to accept it, don't use the New Testament to prove it. They just will pull a passage out and say, no, it says right here, it's not true. That there's no hell? It's, it's not that there's no hell. There was a hell. It played a purpose, Sheol. It has a historical purpose in the biblical sense. But when Jesus came and did what he did, according to scripture, Hell and Satan were cast away into the lake of fire, which was created for them. They're done. That's the good news. So it was Augustine who came up and said, I hate my flesh so much. Hell is going to burn my flesh away. And he really promoted that. And that got into our liturgy and it got into the think, thinking of people. But the Bible, I'll, I'll stand knee to knee with anybody on hell with the Bible and go through what it actually says. And I think anyone who is trying to seek for truth would say, I will side with him on that one. So I was able to see it in the Bible through this little book given to me. There's a super cool This American Life episode that turned into a movie that I saw at Sundance just a few months ago about a famous African-American preacher. Heard about that. Who, uh, who came out that there wasn't a hell. And, and what happened to his congregation? He lost his ministry. Yeah, because people <laughs> want there to be a hell who are yeah. Christian. I don't know why, but they do. Well, we lost more of our ministry of that one too. Lost it, big okay. time. Okay. okay. I want to give you a really quick side story that's interesting to this. Yeah, I want to hear it. The guy who gave, the guy who wrote that book, his, uh, his sister-in-law gave me the book. She was going to a Bible study my wife was teaching. And I didn't know him. I read it, and I came to understand it. So then later, I flew out to Colorado for a private meeting, and I met him. His name's Daryl Scott. Daryl Scott was a pastor, and his daughter, Rachel Scott, was the first girl, first person killed at Columbine by Niebold. And he, 
said, he goes and he teaches about this concept about there being no hell. And the, and, the, and the evangelicals say to him, well, you know, you probably haven't been in a position where someone's hurt you bad enough to um, uh, 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 believe in a hell. If someone hurt you bad enough, you would probably embrace hell fully. And Daryl Scott is able to say, well, actually, I, don't, I think uh, uh, Klebold and the other guy, I think they're okay. I think that God is, and that was a real witness to me. Fascinating connection there. So that helped me. The, uh, just for those who want to know, uh, the movie is called Come Sunday, and it's about Bishop Carlton Pearson. Yeah. Um, so check that out if you're interested. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, and I would concur with what he says, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then John uh, so sp stepped out and said, don't think there is a hell any longer. And that was a ripple that got out to the evangelicals, less support. Then came the big one. Someone from Canada sends me a book. It's a guy from who wrote it, and it's called Christianity's Greatest Dilemma. And I said, okay, so what? It's, it's, I can tell it's not written too well or whatever, and it's mass produced by home publishing. And uh, I, I get into it, and what his premise is is Jesus has come back. And I'm like, this guy's so full of it. Come on. There's no way, you know. So I'm going to go to the Bible, and I'm going to prove this book wrong. So I started in, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing the research, and I'm looking at the Greek, and I'm looking at the history, and I'm looking at the statements of the early church leaders, and I'm looking at what Jesus said and what it says in the Bible. And bottom line, bottom line, it's eschatology is the, is the big word. End times. Study of end times. The eschatology of Christianity is tweaked, and it keeps people coming to church, sitting on the edge of their seat, saying, Jesus is going to come back. i got to live in fear. i got to be ready for the rapture and all of this stuff. So I came out, and I, and I realized my eschatology had been wrong. When your eschatology changes in the faith, everything in the faith changes. If Jesus has come back, and I would love to go at length on how he has come back and why, um, if he has done that, it changes the complexion of what this faith is all about. Now. How's he come back? Okay. Um, the Bible is a record and a history of the Jews. And it's a record of God working his will through that nation and people. He was, they were promised a Messiah. He came to them. I came only to the house of Israel. When John the Baptist came to announce him, he, he came prophetically and, and, and he said, listen, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. You know what that imagery is? It's like, it's coming down. Everything that we have had is coming down. Prepare yourself for this kingdom that's coming. In Matthew 24, Jesus takes his disciples and they ask him three questions. They say, when will all this stuff happen that you've told us about? When will be your kingdom? And what will be the end of this age? And Jesus tells them in Matthew 24 exactly what's going to happen. And you know what he says in Matthew 24, 34? He says, all of this will happen within a generation. It'll all happen within a generation. That's a 40 year span of time in biblical tents. In 70 AD, Nero came in, Titus came in and they destroyed Jerusalem so badly that all the prophetic utterances that Jesus said about the end times occurred then. As substantiated by Josephus, secular writer, as substantiated by Cassius Dio, secular, secular writer, as substantiated by uh, uh, a number of secular writers, that everything that you read about the end times, from the lights in the sky to the eagles to the dead to the, all that blood and all this other stuff, fulfilled when Jerusalem was utterly routed, their temple was taken down piece by piece, their genealogies were burned. We don't even know who Jews are today. They don't even know who they are. They don't have genealogy. The priesthood was burned down and gone. That was the end of the age. In the, in the King James Bible. That was the second coming. That was the second the, coming. Okay. And the end of that. When we read. We read the apocalypse in, or whatever. The apocalypse. Okay. It was everything. Okay. We read in scripture the end of the world. That's because the King James translators decided to put world there. But the Greek is always age. When will be the end of the age? It's going to be the end of the age. One more thing. Every one of Jesus' apostles taught, he's coming, he's coming. They used words like quickly in the Greek that m could not mean more than a, a few years. It's going to happen quickly. The book of Revelation says, I'm coming quickly, quickly, 
quickly. It opens with that, it ends with that, quickly. Quick. And it was to the seven churches on earth at that time when it was written because it was all written for them materially. He came materially, wiped out that age, it's done, and we enter into a new age called grace. That's the good news. You say, I want a good heaven, you've got it. That's the good news of Jesus Christ on this earth. He came and he saved the world and the religion, to play religion, is done for. It is no longer necessary. It's all spirit. It's in the heart. That's what God says. He says, in these last days, after this time, I will write my laws in the hearts of people. And no one will say to his neighbor, know the Lord, know the Lord. Everyone will know him. And so we have a complete turnover when your eschatology is correct. But because it doesn't bode well for church playing, the religionists have discounted and discarded their, this eschatology and they have embraced futurism. We're waiting for Jesus to come back. To, and, and Mormonism is founded on that. Latter-day Saints, waiting for it. Baloney. So there's my, my pitch. So, okay, so Jesus has already come back. We're not waiting for him to come back. There's no longer a hell. Yeah. It, it seems like people would like this. Talk really quickly also about, it says the combination of new end time view and the view of eternal punishment moved us into seeing and promoting the Christian faith in different ways. So how did that change how you preached? And also talk about the Trinity. Okay. Because your changes, your views on the Trinity Definitely. also changed. Definitely. Talk about those two Okay. The, the way it changed how I preach is that I used to teach an objective faith. I used to teach that this is the truth, you must do this. This is what it is, you must do that. And I would preach that over the pulpit or on the television show. I realize that in an age when the spirit is working upon individuals, that objective religion is done. We live in, in, in a world where the faith of people is subjectively lived. It's subjectively understood. John decides he wants to believe in this or that. We follow that. John doesn't, it's okay. Because you're responsible for who you are before God at the end of your life. And so that's how we go about it, is you are responsible for your faith. Because God has said, I will write my laws on their hearts and they'll do what they want. Paul says clearly, happy is the man that does what he wants in his life. There is no more objective religion to heap upon you. No more. And that's how it changed our way of doing uh, the faith. And which is why I am additionally incensed at what the churches do around us in this valley and around the world, to be frank. Quickly on the Trinity, it was just another thing I realized. Uh, and it's debatable. And uh, I just don't believe, I don't, of course, I, don't, I reject completely Joseph Smith's version of the, God, of the Godhead as a material God and all that. But I absolutely um, have rethought God. And I think there's one God, one God. And I think that he had a human son that was God in the flesh. And they call him the son because he's in the flesh. I don't see it three separate beings, co-eternal, co-equal forever and ever. I see it as being God. His words became flesh and dwelled among us. And he sent his spirit. One God, one God manifesting himself. That is not Trinitarianism. Tr classic creedal Trinitarianism is there are three that have co-eternally, co-equally existed for eternity, uncreated, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These three are one, but they are as separate as you and I and him. And there's absolutely, I do not embrace that at all from scripture. One final point I wanna make. Everything we talk about is from a, as scholastic as I can get view of scripture. It is not made up so that we can start some religion. It's not made up so that I can be unique. It, it, it is an approach to scripture that I do not alone take. I just happen to take all these disparate, unique views and incorporate them into one, what we do here at campus. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Sean, for this first hour. Um, we are going to wrap this first segment with Sean McCraney now, but stay tuned. We are not done. It's been super fun to hear about Sean's life since, uh, since our last interview with him, but don't go away because we are going to continue. We are going to talk in our second segment with Sean McCraney about you know, the core tenets of Christianity now uh, that he's preaching here um, on, on campus and in his uh, television program, Heart of the Matter. We are going to, I'm gonna sort of drill down with him on his beliefs and try and understand maybe from a bit more of a secular perspective, 
you know, what the foundation of his beliefs are today and kind of what they are and how he's viewing things. Um, and then we're going to talk about the criticisms mentioned earlier in this episode. Uh, you know, you know, we consider ourselves, um, you know, interested in helping people uh, transition uh, away from Mormon orthodoxy or fundamentalism. Uh, and sometimes that means transitioning to other Christian churches. So we're going to dig in a little bit and maybe even challenge some of Sean's criticisms of uh, some of the Christian churches around here, like South Mountain, like K2 and others. We're going to talk about his concerns, push back a little bit, and then maybe close by just understanding where he is today and where he sees himself going. So thanks for joining us on Mormon Stories Podcast. Appreciate everyone who supports us financially to make this possible. Uh, grateful to Sean and his uh, awesome staff of volunteers who are helping us. And please stay tuned again soon for part two of my interview with uh, born-again Mormon Sean McCraney here on Mormon Stories. Take care, everybody.